Hello, we'll be using Noon Setting of Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me, evening, morning, and noon. I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm for today will be Psalm, will be psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commands. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The text for meditation comes from John chapter 8, uh, verses 21 to 30. So this is continuing his speech in uh, the temple. So what came just before were some words uh, in the temple treasury. He was basically uh, talking to the people about himself as uh, a witness of himself. They don't, they don't understand that he has a more credible witness, which is God the Father. So he's basically laying the groundwork that he is the son of God. Yeah, the son of God, so the son of the Father. So, from verse 21. Then Jesus said again to them, I go my way, and you will seek me, and will die in your sins. Where I go, there you cannot come. Then the Jews said, Will he kill himself? For he says, Where I go, there you cannot come. And he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Even the very same thing that I say to you. I have many things to say and to judge of you. Yea, and he who sent me is true, and I speak in the world those things that I have heard from him. However, they did not understand that he, what he was saying. Uh, he was speaking of his father. Then Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up on high the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father has taught me, even so I speak, and he who sent me is with me. The Father is not, has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As Jesus spoke these words, many believed on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So starting out in verse 21, Jesus says again to the people, I go my way, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sins. Where I go, there you cannot come. 
So this is much harsher language than what happened in chapter 7 when he said this. In chapter 7, when he's saying, you will seek me and you cannot, you will not find me, uh, he didn't tack on there, you will die in your sins. Which is essentially what Jesus is saying in chapter 7, but uh, is not is not bringing it into the fullness of force, which he does here in chapter 8. So when Jesus is saying, you will seek me and you will die in your sins, where I go, there you cannot come, Jesus is not simply pointing to uh, his ascension into heaven. I'm sorry, uh, uh, his ascension into heaven following his death on the cross and before the resurrection. So Jesus Christ, uh, in his death, proclaimed his victory over her death to those in hell, so this is the sentence to hell in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, but he was also in heaven with the Father at that time. So people sought him on the earth, they could not find him. But when Jesus is talking about specifically, uh, you will seek me and you will die in your sins, uh, where I go, there you cannot come, he is very much targeting the ascension. So in the ascension, following the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he ascends up into heaven, and uh, we seek him, we cannot find him in this world, but we will come to him because the Holy Spirit will bring us to our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven so that we may dwell with him awaiting the resurrection of the dead. And in the resurrection of the dead, uh, we will have Jesus Christ with us forevermore. So those who are seeking Jesus Christ, or sorry, <clears throat> those who are searching for him so that they might have life, although they do not want to uh, give up their unbelief, so they have rejected Jesus Christ, they continue to reject him, they merely want eternal life. They will try to find him, but they will not find him even afterwards, because they would be uh, removed from him. The presence of Jesus Christ among us is the gift and, and grace that is given to us as believers, and is an eternal promise. Those who will die in their sins, those who will remain outside of the forgiveness of Christ because they continue and persist in unbelief, they will seek Jesus for the purpose of eternal life, but they will not find him. Um, that theme was brought out uh, in John chapter 6 with the bread of life discourse. There was a whole bunch of people following Jesus Christ, searching for him, trying to uh, even make him king at one point. So they really wanted him. Jesus talked about well, I have the bread of life, he who eats of it will have life everlasting. Everybody who was searching for them, for him, they went, yes, I want that. And then Jesus started telling them, well, I'm the bread of life, I came from heaven, and you have to believe in me. And they kind of going, oh, I don't know about this, I don't believe you're, you're the Christ. And then Jesus even continues beyond that, where he's saying, my, my flesh is true bread, my, my blood is true drink. Uh, and he's saying that no one can come into the kingdom of heaven unless they partake of the bread of life. So, <clears throat> this is, and as I was making the case in chapter 7, this is a spiritual eating and drinking you know, of Jesus Christ because he's saying that everyone has to do this. So, what about those people who have not had a chance to have the Lord's Supper? Are they condemned to hell for eternity? No. It's a spiritual eating and drinking of God because... Uh, Jesus, because he's saying, I am the bread of life, he who believes in me has everlasting life. And then he explains beyond that what, what this uh, eating and drinking is. So it's a, it's a faith unto the Lord's Supper, not, not the Lord's Supper proper, but a faith unto the Lord's Supper uh, and reception of the Lord's Supper. So these people, uh, upon hearing these things from Jesus in chapter 6, well, they start falling away because it's a hard saying and they don't want to follow it. So even though they've been seeking Jesus Christ for quite a long time, they reject him ultimately because he is not who they wanted him to be. So he is much greater than they had thought, but they wanted to have uh, the Son of God conform to their ideals of who the Son of God should be, rather than Jesus revealing to them who the Father truly is, and that they have not been worshipping the Father as they should. So, uh, the Jews, okay, going back to chapter, John chapter 8, so the Jews, after they hear uh, that they will die in their sins and they will not be able to come to Jesus, they, they're confused about this because they're worldly, and they say, 
they're asking, well, will he kill himself then? Does that mean he's going to die and then we won't be able to find him because he's dead? Is that what he means? And in a way, yes, because Jesus Christ will die and they will not be able to find him, but it's, it's not because Jesus is killing himself or, or anything like that. It is because they are only seeing this from a very limited point of view. As Jesus Christ himself explains in the following verse, you, referring to these Jews, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, so I am the Christ, uh, the, the Messiah, one, the one sent by the Father, you will die in your sins. So Jesus is telling these people, well, look, you are from the world. I am from heaven. And this isn't and because this is John writing and speaking, uh, we know that this doesn't just mean the location, well, you are of this world, I am of the heavens, and neither the two shall mix. The idea is that uh, being from the world, the people are remaining in the world which is far away from God. So that the world is a separation from God uh, in, in the Gospel of John. So the Jews are beneath in the sense that they are far away from Jesus Christ. They're far away from God himself. So Jesus is from above because it is uh, heaven descending to earth so that the earth might be sanctified by our Lord, whereas those who are on the earth will be beneath if they persist in their sins and reject that which is from above. So, <clears throat> to further illustrate the point that this, the above and beneath is not simply a location type of idea, but association with God or without God, uh, back, way back, in John chapter 3, at the beginning of John chapter 3, when Jesus begins uh, talking to Nicodemus about basically baptism, and Jesus in chapter 3 verse 3 tells Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man be born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, born anew or born again uh, is a not the best translation, the best translation is born from above. So when Jesus is talking about, I'm from above, you are from beneath, he's saying that those who will be born anew, those who are born again in baptism, those who are born from above, will be given that which is of God. So you are above because you are baptized. You are born from above and you are uh, with Jesus Christ. So you as a baptized believer have the promise given to you that you will be be able to find Jesus Christ and not die in your sins, but die to the flesh and live with Christ forever. Jesus, when he is also saying, I, you are of this world and I am not of this world, again, the world is more of a figurative sense where it's uh, the world of unbelief, the world of darkness that does not understand the light, that wars against light and is, has not understood it. So the world is that which is sinful. So these people are remain in their sins. Jesus is not of this world. He is of the kingdom of God. Jesus will mention this explicitly in chapter 19, I think. His conversation with Pontius Pilate where he says, my kingdom is not of this world. So the kingdom of Jesus Christ is that which is beyond what the world has to offer. It is uh, that which is of God. So when he's when Jesus is talking to the Jews here, he's making a hard and fast distinction that if you are not with me, if you're not from above, if you're not removed from this world, you're in the world, you're beneath me, and you are sinful. So you will die in your sins. So unless uh, you believe in me, so unless you have faith, life-giving faith, you will die in your sins. So you will remain in this condition forever. So the Jews go, well, well, then who are you? So Jesus says, yeah, unless you believe that I am he, so that I am Messiah, uh, 
you'll die in your sins. Well, the people will have to ask, well, then who are you? Because we need to know who you are in order to believe in you to not die in our sins. So Jesus says to them, even the very same thing that I may say to you, I have many things to say and to judge of you. Yea, and he who has sent me is true, and I speak in the world in those things that I have heard from him. So that's basically saying, refer back to the speech that I had before. So, very briefly, John chapter 8, verses 14 to 18, is Jesus saying, I am this I and the Father are uh, equal in our witness of, of me as the Messiah. So I am the light of the world. Which kind of, that was the phrase that entered into this whole conversation. So, so Jesus is saying that I am the light of the world. And when I was talking about this in the previous devotion, I was saying how that means that uh, Jesus Christ is the life of the world. That which began the world, that established its reality, that created all things within it. And that produced all life within it and that sustains all life within it. So Jesus Christ is the light which, uh, which produces life within the world. So it is uh, sus sustaining all creation. So that which is in darkness is that which is sinful, which is not of the light, that is hiding from the light. So everything that is not of the light is hiding in darkness of its sin and being removed from life itself, the sustaining nature of Jesus Christ. So that is the witness that Jesus is saying, yeah, remember that I said this. Now, uh, and, and, oh yeah, and Jesus also reiterates that this is not just him speaking but the Father. So again, for uh, Jewish law, you need two or three witnesses. So Jesus is one witness, the Father is another, and the people are just not understanding that it is the Father who is witnessing of Christ. Um, which means, <clears throat> yeah, so in verse 27, however, the Jews did not understand that Jesus was speaking of his Father, his Heavenly Father. So in their, because they were confused, Jesus continues in verse 28. Jesus said to them, when you are lifted up on, when you have lifted up on high the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, even so I speak. So, lifted up on high is a reference to the cross. Jesus went on a little bit about this, also when he was talking about baptism in John chapter 3, where he was saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so going way back, Old Testament, bronze serpent in the desert, people were being bitten by these serpents because of their sins, dying from the venom. Uh, a bronze serpent was lifted up so that anyone who had been bitten by this ma snake may look upon Jesus, sorry, look upon the serpent, bronze serpent, and live. So this was, so in faith, people uh, were healed by God. Now, Jesus Christ on the cross, he is, um, th there's a interesting nuance of, of imagery going on there. So very briefly, very briefly. We who have been bitten by the first serpent. So the first serpent in Genesis chapter 3, Satan himself. So poisoned by him with sin, we look upon Jesus Christ as the perfected uh, human being. And trusting in our, our Lord and his promises, we receive grace by faith where we are made alive by looking upon Jesus Christ on the cross. So that is why Jesus Christ is lifted up. He is lifted up so that we may see him being between us and the Father so that when we look up to Jesus Christ, we're looking up above to God and God is looking down through Jesus Christ to us, giving us his grace and favor to us so that we might be born of above. So we are elevated in faith so that we may partake of the grace of God, which he so freely gives to us. So Jesus is saying, when you see me on the cross, when you have elevated me up there, when I am healing the entire world, that, I've, that I'm taking the entire world, world's sin, destroying that sin upon the cross, so that it all may, all may have life in me. 
then you will know uh, uh, that I am the Messiah, so he says, I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, even so I speak. And he who sent me is with me, the Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. So it is not simply, or not only the action of the person of Jesus Christ that is saving us through, the, through his death and resurrection, but the entire Trinity which is doing this. So when we look at Jesus Christ on the cross, we're looking up to heaven so that the Father receives us through Christ and brings us through, uh, by grace, through faith, uh, into uh, his eternal promises. Then you kind of go, well, how does the Holy Spirit uh, play in all of this because he's not even mentioned here? Well, who do you think is turning your head to Jesus Christ? And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So as we confess in, um, in the explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed, so this is in Luther's small catechism, I believe that it's a... Uh, and of course, world, words are jumbled in my head when I try to quote it. I had it a second go. I know you don't believe me, but I had it a second go in my head. Okay. So the explanation of the third, third article. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So the Holy Spirit is the one who brings you to Christ, so you see him upon the cross. Jesus Christ's actions upon the cross are that which save you. Uh, he is the one who has taken your sins so that you might have his righteousness. Only by the, the perfection of Jesus Christ's life as a human being are you saved. And by the Father, uh, who is making the judicial, action, uh, judicial uh, act in heaven, he is declaring you righteous according to the righteousness of Christ, which is now dwelling within you. So all of this uh, shows to us that in the action of the cross, Jesus Christ being lifted up, that God is working so that we will be saved. So this is absolute proof, according to Jesus Christ here in John chapter 8, this is absolute proof that we have salvation and that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the light of the world, that he is enlightening the world, destroying the sinfulness within it, removing the darkness from our lives, and bringing us into the light so that we may live in life eternally in his newly established recreation of the creation which has been marred in sin, or darkened by sin. Keep the metaphor. So the people should uh, recognize this. And as it says in verse 30, as he spoke these words, many believed on him. So Jesus Christ's testimony actually does bring the light of himself to them so that many may believe and actually have life. So those who were listening to him, they were, uh, Jesus was saying to them, you will die in your sins if you do not believe in me. And the people are going, well, who are you? And Jesus revealed the gospel to them, the gospel light to them, so that by the Holy Spirit these people came to faith and that they were actually saved at that moment. And I'm saying this because I've been talking with some Calvinists for, or at least to, tangentially, and they will say that the people are either predestined to faith or predestined to hell. So, <clears throat> no, this is all about the Holy Spirit working faith within you so that you do not resist his grace, but you actually have the faith so that by faith, God draws you, uh, or sorry, the Holy Spirit draws you to the cross of Christ that you may be saved. And, the whole, and God the Father judged you to be perfect and righteous as Jesus Christ is himself. So at the cross, so yeah, bottom line, those who are apart from Jesus Christ, who are not lifting up their eyes to him in faith when he is lifted up on the cross, they will die in their sins. But for us who have received faith from the Holy Spirit, we look upon, the cross, uh, upon Jesus on the cross, are born from above, um, and are brought into life everlasting through Christ our Lord. Amen.
So we'll continue with the service on page 296 with the Curia. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. We thank you, O Lord Jesus Christ, that you have been the light of our world, that you have come into the world so that we may be freed from the darkness of sin and be brought into your kingdom uh, that is not of this world. We pray, O Lord, that you sustain us by the light of your life so that we may continue to be forgiven all the days of our life and be brought into the kingdom to come in the new heavens and the new earth. We pray, O Lord, that this gospel truth, this message be sent out to all people everywhere so that all may come to faith and all may believe by the Holy Spirit. In your name, O Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Blessed Lord Jesus Christ, at this hour you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms to embrace the world in your death. Grant that all people of the earth may look to you and see their salvation. For your mercy's sake we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. 